You watching. I like anybody watching. It's night three of Poly Week. We've been interviewing a different politician every single night. Joining us this evening, ALP, le ALP leader even, Bill Shorten, everyone. Bill Shorten's going to be here. <laughs> Pretty exciting. I think we have a shot of Bill warming up backstage. Let's have a look at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the good stuff. <laughs> Bill's going to be out here later on. He will get 30 seconds to pitch the policies of the Labor Party to our millennial here at tonight, Lee Lauren. Last night from the Greens, Marine Faruqi did it. While Lauren ate a whole avocado, <laughs> it was disgusting. So it should be a lot of fun. What do you reckon, Bill? Please stop doing that. <laughs> Please stop doing that. Crazy day in Australian politics. Massive story out of Canberra. You know, we've been getting all these leaks lately, stuff about Tony Abbott and his cabinet and Scott Morrison and Kevin Rudd recently too. Well, today we found the source of the leaks and you won't believe what happened next. This story begins at an ex-government sale in Canberra where a person purchased two filing cabinets. They were locked and they were heavy and so they were sold off cheaply. The person some months later got around to attacking the locks on the filing cabinets with a drill and inside they found this incredible trove of documents, thousands of pages, hundreds of documents, all highly sensitive, highly classified cabinet documents. Yes, the cabinet leaks were found in a cabinet! <laughs> cabinet leaks in a cabinet! It's like a babushka doll of cabinets! <laughs> Imagine how pissed off the person who discovered it would be. Oh, man, all I wanted was some old heavy cabinets. Now I got all these fucking government secrets. This is bullshit. <laughs> this is worse than the time I bought a submarine on Gumtree to contain the rotting remains of Harold Holt. Bullshit! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Too soon for Harold Holt gear, everybody? <laughs> ABC political correspondent Greg Jennett even went so far as to liken the cabinet to some renowned whistleblowers. We have Snowden, we have Assange, and now the Australian version involves a couple of metal boxes. <laughs> what the fuck is happening? Oh, Australian politics, truly. You are a bit shit. <laughs> America has Watergate, Europe has the Panama Papers, Australia has a large metal box. <laughs> In the spirit of Poly Week, actually, we're actually we're, we're having the source of the leak on the show tomorrow for an interview. They are choosing to remain anonymous, though. <laughs> Fantastic journalist should win in Walkley. <laughs> of course, everyone's also talking about the big story out of South Africa. Officials in Cape Town have opened a disaster operations centre, putting in place plans to shut down the city's water supply. What? No, not that. I'm talking about important news out of South Africa. It was an action-filled episode of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here last night. And a first for the show, a celebrity deciding to pull the pin. I'll say the official words. I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. See you guys. Bye. That is a pretty cool way to quit your job. Hey guys, I'm Barry, I work in accounts, get me out of here. Joanne, you're a real bitch. <laughs> Bernard Tobik has walked out of the jungle and the backlash online was pretty significant. Lots of people calling him a quitter and, oh, suck and all this stuff. I, do you get the feeling Tobik can't win? He goes into the jungle, people got angry. Ooh, focus on tennis. So he leaves the jungle to focus on tennis and people crack the shits. Get back in that jungle, you quitter! <laughs> what do people want? They've all been worried about his mental health as well. Just remember, he walked off. I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Have you seen that show? They make you eat ostrich anus. On national... He walked away from that. Bernard, you're the healthiest person on the show. <laughs> I'm worried about the people who stayed. They're cool, cool! <laughs> Big news as well. President Trump gave his first State of the Union address uh, tonight and much like Trump's approval ratings, expectations were low. The other question is whether he'll stick to the teleprompter or whether he'll go rogue and we'll get the unfiltered Donald Trump that we've come to know over the last 12 months. His company tax cuts are pretty interesting and, and pretty good, I thought. So let's hope he delivers something inspirational today and it doesn't get too silly. <laughs> Don't you get silly, you silly little 71-year-old man who's the president. Don't you go starting a nuclear war. Don't be silly. Silly Trump. Expectations for Trump's address were so low, people weren't even sure if his own wife was going to show up. Last week, in the wake of all those allegations about him having the affair with the porn star, Sormi Daniels, this is the news, everybody. <laughs> I'm talking you through the news. 
After that happened, Melania cancelled plans to join Trump at the World Economic Forum in Davos, even though it coincided with their 13-year wedding anniversary. Okay? Instead, she went to the Holocaust Memorial Museum. <laughs> wow. I guess we know the state of Trump's union. It's fucked. <laughs> You know your marriage is on the rocks when your wife declines to spend your anniversary with you in Europe because she'd rather be in the world's saddest museum. <laughs> she did turn up to the State of the Union, though. Fair enough. Who would want to miss this? That no people on Earth are so fearless or daring or determined as Americans. If there is a mountain, we climb it. If there's a frontier, we cross it. If there's a challenge, we tame it. If there's a pussy, we grab it. <laughs> Powerful stuff. <laughs> Trump addressed all the main policy areas, North Korea, terrorism, hating brown people. But of course, the mo oh yeah, I'm the bad guy. But of course, <laughs> the most exciting part of any big speech is the cutaways to salty people in the crowd hating it. So please enjoy the Tonightly Highlights Reel, People Hating Trump's State of the Union speech. <laughs> If you're just tuning in, Bill Shorten is coming up later on in the show. Don't miss that. Stay tuned. I'm going to be sitting down with Bill Shorten and have a chat to him about politics stuff. Crazy stories in the news, right? Including this other crazy story. You might remember last November, the New South Wales government ran a poll to rename six new ferries, right? Remember this? Yes. One winner... <laughs> yes, Tom. One winner was Ferry McFerryface. Ferry McFerryface. <laughs> because we here in Australia love a laugh, but also we are idiots. <laughs> New South Wales Transport Minister Andrew Constance explained Ferry 1 even though it had come second after Boaty McBoatface because Boaty was already taken by another vessel. <laughs> yes, having one stupid ferry is fine, but two would be ridiculous. <laughs> well, yesterday it turned out after a Channel 9 Freedom of Information request that Ferry McFerryface only received 182 votes and was not the popular choice and that the real winner was Clean Up Australia founder Ian Keenan with 10 times the number of votes. So how come McFerryface won? How come we're not all riding around on a ferry named Ian? Which I think we could all agree would be heaps less silly. <laughs> Turns out the poll was ignored and the McFerry face was chosen by the Transport Minister, Andrew Constance. Right, he just picked it. This is huge. Andrew Constance, seen here, trying to think of an original name for a ferry, <laughs> ignored the results of a $100,000 poll, suppressed the real winner and went ahead to choose his own personal favourite. Nuts. But hey, well done. Well done to Channel 9 for uncovering the truth. This bombshell. Following in the footsteps of movies like Spotlight and The Post, this is actually the next big corruption-busting expose to be turned into a motion picture. Let's take a look at the trailer. <laughs> it's a public poll. $100,000. It just doesn't add up. Think about it. Do you know anyone who voted for Ferry McFerryface? No. Look at these people. None of them have any idea what's going on right under their noses. So Ian Kiernan got more votes. They warned me that if I went to the press, they'd clean up my family. Jesus Christ. Paul was fake. No, I'm telling you, this goes all the way to mid-levels of state government. Mr. Constance? Sorry, sir, we've got some reporters digging around Ferry McFerry face. Close the door. But... I SAID CLOSE THE DOOR! Are you ready for this? You bet your sweet ass. I RUN THIS FUCKING CITY! <laughs> GOD DAMN YOU, CONSTANCE! SHUT THE BOAT!
doesn't let this go. You don't get it. I ride that ferry. You ride that ferry. Your kids ride that ferry. Do you really want your children riding a ferry that wasn't named after the top result in an online poll? <laughs> well, I don't. I just don't think it should be called that because it didn't technically win. You couldn't leave alone. Now you're dead. Deddy McDeadface. Deddy McDeadface, that's pretty funny. to be the next Prime Minister of Australia. He's the member for Maribyrnong, the leader of the Labour opposition and, quite frankly, a terrible rapper. Would you please welcome Bill Shorten! <laughs> Sorry, Bill. Hi, mate. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. It means a lot. Thank you for being here for Poly Week here at Tonightly. Now, first story. Crazy story of Australian politics today. Yeah. The Cabinet files. A cabinet is found, sold at a second-hand garage sale or some shit, containing yeah. documents from actual Cabinet meetings dating back to the Howard government. Are you terrified about the contents of the Cabinet? I can't believe it happened. <laughs> I mean... Oh. All these spies who are meant to be spying on us, they should just be going shopping in second-hand <laughs> furniture stores in Canberra. Don't give ISIS ideas, Bill Shorten! Come on! Um, listen, it is serious, but it does sound absurd. It's um, kind of crazy, right? But, but, on reflection, isn't it a good thing? I mean, isn't it a good thing that we know these things? Otherwise, these documents would be held away for, like, 30 years. Isn't it good that we know more about what our politicians do, the kind of, like, crazy oh. ideas they kick around in Cabinet meetings? Uh, the government... You shouldn't be able to find information out because someone didn't check a set of filing cabinets. <laughs> then they sold it at a second-hand government furniture sale. And then apparently these filing cabinets were sitting in the shop for some months and someone decided to get the drill out to break into this one. <laughs> Again, we're... the most Australian thing you can do. <laughs> you know, but at least we're on top of it. You know, the government, they're right on top of national security. That's yes. the good news. You don't feel nervous about that at all? No? Uh, they make me feel nervous about a range of things. A range of things, OK. Speaking of feeling nervous, Donald Trump... Uh... <laughs> Did you watch the State of the Union today? Did you catch any of it? No. No. What do you think of him? <laughs> what do you think of old Donny Boy? Uh, it's the American political process has thrown him up. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Before the 2016 US election, you called him barking mad and entirely unsuitable uh, to be leader. Technically, I said some of his views were barking mad. Oh, I see. Good <laughs> clarification. Yep. <laughs> Saved yourself there. Entirely unsuitable to be leader of the free world. Now, you could become the next Prime Minister of Australia. You'll have to deal with him. Would that be a bit awkward? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get through it. OK. <laughs> Listen, if I can work with Tony Abbott and I can work with Malcolm Turnbull and Barnaby, yeah. and Barnaby Joyce, you know, we, we'll Oh, have... yes, you and Tony, famous yeah. friends. Um, <laughs> does he make you feel scared about the state of the world, Donald Trump? Uh, he's only one person. So, at the end of the day, the American system's got checks and balances. Very, very <laughs> diplomatic. That's right. <laughs> Yesterday you spoke at the National Press Club and uh, you announced the latest new policy of a Federal Integrity Commission designed to restore public confidence in the political system because the most corrosive sentiment in democracies around the world is this idea the politicians are only in it for themselves. Do you really think that this commission is going to stop people from thinking that? I think it's a down payment. No, I think that there's a lot that politics has to do in 2018 to restore people's faith. But one thing we can do is by setting up a Federal integrity commission what we then do is we're saying to the people at large most australians whom would want this yeah we're willing to subject ourselves to the same rules as other people so it's a start but i actually think if you really want to restore confidence in 2018 we've got to stop talking about ourselves and talk about the issues which affect families workers young people old people we've got to talk about the issues that affect australians I think we can do better. So, it's a start, though. Restoring faith is interesting to me because I'm going to play you something, and I'm sorry to do this to you, but it's, it is honestly one of the first things I think of when I think about Bill Shorten. You are in no way the worst <laughs> offender of this at all, but this clip to me sums up something about Australian politics. Let's have a look. I understand that the Prime Minister has addressed this in a press conference in Turkey in the last few hours. I haven't seen what she said, but let me say I support what it is that she said. <laughs> Hang on, you haven't seen what she said? But I support what my Prime Minister said, so... Well, what's your view? Well, my view is what the Prime Minister's view is. You don't know what that is? Well, I'm sure she's right. I'm sure she's right. <laughs> now, it's funny now, 
You had a lot more hair there. Great times. But yeah. that, that is why people hate politics right there, right? What, what do you think when you look back at that clip? Oh, I should have answered the question differently. Yeah. No question. Why didn't you? Because Julia Gillard was under a lot of attack and I thought, I'm not joining in. So sometimes in life, you just got to be loyal. you just got to back them. And at that stage, I thought, uh, I wasn't sure what she'd said, so therefore I just thought, better that I back her and don't cause another point of controversy. But you know, Having said that, I would now answer the question differently. Right. Um, also, I'm disturbed to see how young I look there. <laughs> so you're dealing with a big issue, but I'm also looking at the other issue. The other oh, my Lord. <laughs> OK. So, in terms of faith and trust, and uh, focused specifically on you and your leadership, uh, you have been polling pretty well. The Labor Party has been uh, winning a lot of polls in Two Party Preferred. It still seems Australians seem to prefer Malcolm Turnbull over you when it comes to um, leadership. Why do you think that is? Well, let's see what happens at the next election. OK. Well, uh, we've got uh, lots of good policies, and I've got no doubt that if Australians have a clear idea about what I stand for and what the Labor Party stands for at the next election, we'll do well. OK. Yesterday, uh, you were asked about Labor's position on the Adani Carmichael coal mine. Here's what you said at the National Press Club. You can't be serious about climate change and energy and sort of have a bet every which way. So we're certainly looking at the Adani matter very closely. If it doesn't stack up commercially, if it doesn't stack up environmentally, it will absolutely not receive our support. Do you have a time frame on that? Uh, yeah, it's underway. <laughs> <laughs> very vague there. Underway on the policy. No, well, let me... Well, you only used half of the clip. Sure. There was plenty more in that clip. Yep. I said that I am concerned about the impact on the reef. I said... The global thermal coal market isn't strong, so I'm not sure what the financial underpinnings of the deal are. I went on to say I'm concerned about other mining jobs, but this might undercut by flooding the market. I then went on to say I'm concerned about the water table at the Artesian Basin, uh, and I do think there are big concerns. So, you know, behind that bit which you picked... No, sure. ..there was more there. Well, and, we were uh, interested in... in the, the story out of that the clip was, that, was the question of whether or not Labor is changing its policy when it comes to a diner. You have all those concerns... Um, is Federal Labor going to oppose that mine? What else are you waiting for uh, to allay your concerns? Oh, we're doing... We're talking to all the groups. We're talking to the environmentalists. We're talking to the people who care about the reef. We're talking to tourism interests. The mine got uh, approved four years ago. Why hasn't Labor sort of sorted out what they think about this already? Oh, no. The... Again, you know, like, we come on and have a bit of a laugh and a chat, but let's set the record straight. We've said for the last two years that not a single dollar of taxpayer money should be used. So that's already our view not a single dollar of taxpayer money. Now, that doesn't... Perhaps that's a bit complex to explain in a simple soundbite so it doesn't get the coverage. But the Labor Party is the party of the environment. And what we will do is, as new information comes to light, we're prepared to toughen our position. OK. So we know that if the coal from the mine will be burnt, it would emit 120 million tonnes of carbon annually. Uh, there's concerns, as you say, about dredging up the reef and the water extraction. Um, 16% of Australians think the mine should go ahead, including just 7.5% of ALP Labor's. It just seems like, what, what are you waiting for? Why not come out with a policy now about this massive issue and this sort of totemic, emblematic issue when it comes to climate change, if you are, as you say, the party of climate change? Well, I'm clearly, by the answer I gave you then and the answer I gave yesterday, uh, I'm increasingly sceptical about the merits of this proposal. But I'll make sure that when we make a decision that we've crossed every T and dotted every I. But I'm increasingly sceptical about this mine. I don't know if it'll ever go ahead anyway. The banks won't back it. Uh, what I also want to do is deal with the issue of jobs in North Queensland because if this doesn't go ahead, I think you have to demonstrate you've got an alternative set of jobs which can provide opportunities for people there. So, yes, I share the scepticism, which a lot of people in the community are exhibiting, but when we make a decision, we're potentially the government of Australia. So I don't just get to peel off a line. We've got to make sure that we can back it up, and that's what we're doing. Could you actually stop it? If Labor came out to oppose this mine, could you actually do something, or is it simply the absence of Labor support that will, you, you, in your words, or will, will It hasn't received all its final approvals from the, state and fed, from the state and federal government, so they've still got some more hurdles to go through. Um, it's not clear-cut exactly how you would stop it, but this is a company who's, every time they've set a deadline for themselves, haven't achieved it. And I just, at this stage, we don't even know where their finance is coming from. So I think it's a road for this mine to travel for it to actually start. OK. Let's talk about housing. Very important to the people who watch this show, young people across the country, and uh, you've made it a priority as, as part of your mm -hmm. party. Do you own any investment properties? No. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, but isn't that a bit of the challenge of politics? Um, when we answer your question and we just answer it straight, it you good. still get the cynicism, yeah. so... No, no. 
So the answer is no. I believe you. Well, there, well, there was a list, right? The, the ABC posted a, uh, an article about this, about the um, interest list of investment properties and mm -hmm. such. And that list showed that 96% of federal MPs own property. 48% of them own investment properties. There are about 100,000 people becoming new home buyers every single year. But there are like 2 million Australians, more than that, well more than that, with investment properties. So isn't it kind of true that there isn't a great political incentive to make housing cheaper? Oh, well, we've already done that. At the last election, in fact, 18 months ago, we decided to go after uh, an issue which for 30 years has been put in the too hard basket currently, and for the last 30 years. Taxpayer subsidies are used to um, support investors buying properties. I think that's just a waste of money, especially for existing properties. What it's doing is it uh, means that first home buyers who pay their taxes are actually subsidising the investors to compete against them to further drive up housing prices. So we've said uh, no to negative gearing. If you vote for Labor, we will remove this tax subsidy for people buying existing housing. The Treasury found that would have a relatively modest impact on property prices. For young people, property isn't modestly expensive. It is fucking expensive. <laughs> Don't you, shouldn't you do more in, the, in that area if you really want to get those big outcomes that you're talking about? No party in 30 years has taken on the property lobby like we have. No party. Turnbull and his friends were very unscrupulous when they said that what we would do would crash the housing market, when they had evidence from their own experts that we wouldn't. So we are up for the fight against the vested interests of the accountants who are pushing these schemes and the housing market, oh, sorry, and the uh, housing investors who get a swag of investment properties. But that's not the only thing we're doing. If we want to help young people, we also want to make sure that the cost of going to uni is not too high. We also want to keep the price of TAFE down. We also want to make sure they get penalty rates on weekends. When it comes to looking at these issues, we've got policies which actually help young people get ahead. Uh, you know, and that's, that puts us streets ahead of the uh, government. The Whitlam government made tertiary education free. Bernie Sanders ran on a campaign of making education free for young people on a tertiary level. Why doesn't federal Labor have that policy now? Why can't we do it in 2018? Well, it sounds good, but you've got to pay for it too. Um, what we want to do, first of all, is make sure that every child gets a properly resourced secondary and primary school education. We're opposing cuts to universities. The Turnbull government's got big cuts on the table. Uh, time and time again, since the Libs have got in, they want to increase, they've tried to increase the interest rate that you pay on your hex. We've successfully opposed that so far. We want to provide 100,000 free scholarships for young people over the next five years to do science and education and uh, engineering and maths courses. So we've got some pretty good policies to help uh, redress the balance for young people. Well, I'll tell you who'll be the judge of that is our resident millennial here at Tonightly, OK? Every week we've asked our political guests to pitch their policies <laughs> to our resident millennial, Lauren. She joins us now from her parents' house. Hello, Lauren. Hi, Tom. Are you just visiting your parents or what's no, going on? No, I live here. Please send help. OK. <laughs> no, Mum, I'm at work. All right. <laughs> Very happy home life there. OK, now, Bill, you have 30 seconds. Millennials only have a 30-second attention span. Talk down that camera there. Pitch to young Lauren there. Why? Young people should vote for Labor. Your time starts now. We think Australia can do better. We can be fairer. We can make sure we don't leave anyone behind. Specifically, we'll make sure that we keep your cost of going to university and TAFE down. <laughs> Start rapping again. Come on, dab or something. We'll make sure that uh, you have got a chance to compete in the housing market. We'll restore your penalty rates and we'll take real action on climate change. And if you don't like any of that, we'll make avocado tax deductible. Holy shit! <laughs> and 24 seconds, time's up! <laughs> All right, Lauren, what do you reckon of that? Bill, can I just have a house, please? OK. <laughs> well, you tried, Bill Shorten. Bill Shorten, everybody, thank you for being here, sir. Thank you for your time, much appreciated. That is our show for tonight. Tomorrow I'll be joined by Liberal MP Tim Wilson. Hope you can join us then. Asian Provocateur is up next on ABC Comedy. Thanks for watching. Good night. Thank you, sir. Tonight on Comedy, remember...